Hey everyone, before we get started, you need to know about a friend of the show's incredible art. Past and future guest Izzy Fisher has original creations as prints, enamel pins, magnets, tea towels, and stickers. Check them out at untidyvenus.etsy.com. And if that wasn't enough, you can also get paracord bracelets and dog leashes created by also friend of the show, Steve. I currently have in my hallway Cosmo the goat print, a purple star wolf, and unicorns of the world. I have a paracord dog leash. I have an entire set of tie-dye tea towels. And uh, I'm very excited for the enamel pins that will be coming to me very soon. If you go to untidyvenus.etsy.com and you use the promo code HEMCAST, that's H-E-A-M-C-A-S-T, you'll save 15% off your order. And currently, orders over $35 ship free. Again, that promo code is HEMCAST, save 15%. And she's not a sponsor of the show. I just want you to use that promo code for you to save money and for her to know that I told you she's awesome. Welcome to Happily Ever Aftermath, the podcast that explores the movies that influenced how we view love and romantic relationships. Yes, there will be spoilers. I'm your host, Diana Rodrick Sconard. Happiness is not happiness without a violin playing goat. We're talking about Notting Hill 1999, and uh, I am very pleased to have Jason from The Misplay join me for this. Hi, welcome, Jason. Hello, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, wonderful to have you here. And uh, I should probably explain to our audience that we're on kind of like the way William was on a couple of blind dates. We're on a podcast blind date right now. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be introduced to you from my husband, Ryan, who has been on the show and also has been on your show. That's right. I hope I'm going to end up being cast as the perfect guy and not uh, not the other two people that were just like really bad dates. So we're actually going to be jumping into it like right away. But if you're the perfect guy for this, like you still don't get the happy ending. So like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, I, I have an alternate reality of this movie where he actually ends up with that person as being like the better fit for Hugh Grant. So I'm OK with that because I, I think that might actually in, you know, I don't want to throw out any spoilers, but I think that would be a better ending to that movie. Well, that, that's a nice, we'll call it a tease. That actually works out pretty well. We'll call that a tease right there. So uh, for, let's see here. Let's pull up the official things for anyone who uh, isn't too familiar with Notting Hill. So it's uh, 1999 and... Hold on, hold on. Do you think there's anybody listening to your podcast that is not familiar with Notting Hill? It's a, it's a podcast about rom-coms. <laughs> this, is, this is the best rom-com. Is it the okay? So now I'm going to need you to defend that in a three arc argument. Okay. But uh, before you do that, let's let's do this here, just in case. Just in case there are people who are, for some reason, wanted to get into all the spoilers and about Notting Hill, but have not seen Notting Hill. So, William Thacker, Hugh Grant, is a London bookstore owner whose humdrum existence is thrown into romantic turmoil when famous American actress Anna Scott, Julia Roberts, appears in his shop. A chance encounter over spilled orange juice leads to a kiss that blossoms into a full-blown affair. And I got to say, since this is 1999, that colliding of orange juice, trope, meat cute, just like it was exploding in tropiness. And I couldn't really get, um, I wasn't sure if I was going to be into it or just like, but I'm in 2020 and uh, I think my tropes need to be a little bit more... uh, juicier than orange juice if that makes sense oh, but that's okay I, that's a bit of a but you know I, i'm surprised orange juice even makes the cut like i don't know where you get the summaries from but like i teach fifth grade english and so like guys we're not bringing up the orange juice when we're writing a summary of this movie in three sentences the orange juice is probably not making the summary <laughs> i was debating if i wanted to stop the sentence before uh but but okay fair enough you're you're correct. This is like the most rom com of rom-coms ever. So thank you for bringing this to the show because part of, of what, you know, makes my podcast really, really click is these are the movies that influenced us and don't, don't hurt me. This is the first time I've seen Notting Hill. Wow. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So I have, I have this kind of like dark corner 
of, you know, that needs to have a light shined on it of that. So, I mean, Pretty Woman was on TBS a lot. So like I was able to catch that, but Notting Hill eluded the cable networks in my formative years. I mean, I guess by 1999, I had to have actively needed to go out for them. So I need to know your Notting Hill story. Wow. So did you, did you know that Pretty Woman's actually the, uh, the, the prequel to Notting Hill? Okay. I'm going to need you to tell me more. No, that's not true at all. Though. Damn it. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> not at all. Um, okay. So my relationship with the movie, um, it's funny because I think, you know, I've listened to your podcast and I think you have a different relationship with movies in general than I do. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's a fun movie. I can rewatch it in the way that like I can rewatch Groundhog Day or Empire Records. And I can't say that about like a lot of movies, but I enjoy good writing. And I think the writing in this movie is really great. Um, the supporting characters all have, you know, for lack of a better word, character, they're unique. So what was it? 1999. I was 19. I'm sure I saw it in the theater. I'm sure it was like a date movie, if not like a date rental movie. My issue with rom-coms, I guess in general, is that I had a difficult time in my 20s or even you know, my, my early 30s separating movie love from real love. I felt if I was like never inspired to go outside someone's house with a poster board on Christmas and declare my love or vice versa, it wasn't really meant to be, um, uh-huh. which by the way, almost did. A friend talked me off the ledge, so I did not do that. That's but a as good friend. F- yes, yes. And as for like a special connection to the movie, I don't think it's like meaningful in my day to day in any way. I enjoy it. The, uh, the Elvis Costello cover is not like my wedding song. She may be the face I can't forget, but like, I'm sure it's somebody's. Um, so it was a nice movie to rewatch with my wife, which is interesting because you just watched it for the first time as well. And she told me, I haven't, I don't think I've seen it. And like two minutes into it, she's like, oh, I kind of remember this. Right. Which which is actually a funny story with my relationship with my wife, because when we were dating, she really wanted me to watch About a Boy. And I was like, oh, I've never seen that, which also, again, Hugh Grant. Yeah. I was like, no, I've never seen that. You should come over. We should watch that movie, right? As like a datey thing, as something for us to do. And like five minutes in, I'm like, oh, I've seen this. Yeah. <laughs> when it got started, I, I was crossing my fingers and I'm just like, it's not a kill. It's not about a boy. Watch the right movie. Watch the right movie. Because, you know... Actually, about a boy. That's that's Nick Hornby who wrote about a boy the book, and I'm a huge High Fidelity fan and rewatched it for the podcast as well. So like, there's like this Venn diagram of just like Hugh Grant and like you know uh, Richard Curtis who was the yep. writer of this, and you've got the Four Weddings and a Funeral, and you've got um, Love Actually, which you I assume alluded to earlier with your writing on a poster and declaring your love with somebody. So you know it's all kind of coming together in its own way. What's weird about Hugh Grant, um, now Sense and Sensibility, that I watched very much um, in my teen years, and you've got that Hugh Grant, which kind of to me runs parallel with this one in its own way. This one's a little bit more, um, I don't know, modern. I don't. I wouldn't say their characters are different, but like he's still like kind of the very quiet, gentle, you know, s- you know, smaller compared to the you know more larger than life characters surrounding him. But the other side of that is uh, Bridget Jones's diary, where he is the uh, smarmy, devilly kind of character, which is, according to the writer of that movie, uh, more in line with his actual real life personality. So I'm not really sure like what Hugh Grant train I'm on. Uh, so is this the one that just kind of like kind of sunk into that? Or are you able to just like really disconnect the actors from their characters? No, I I mean, that's Hugh Grant in every movie for me, even, you okay. know, even, even it's even difficult, even though he's a bit of a, you know, like what you said in Bridget Jones's diary, it's still like, I still love him. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> have you, have you other favorite Hugh Grant movies? I'm assuming this is number one. Yeah, this is, this is number one. Love Actually, of course, uh, okay. Four Weddings and a Funeral. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the Hugh Grant trilogy of, ah, no, that's the, that's the Grant Curtis trilogy. It okay. is. Yeah. He, I mean, and, I mean, he plays basically the same character. He said as much. <laughs> uh, so four weddings and a funeral. I got to that one probably in my twenties. It was, it was good. It was good. Did you watch the uh, the Hulu revival series? I didn't. 
yeah, it's kind of hard to revisit these things where it's just like, I'm sure it's fine. I just, I'm fine with what I have over here. Nice. So, po so probably a date thing. Um, I hear you say it's not really like, you know, the, the bigger movies that like, you know, on an everyday basis there, but there was something that kind of spoke to you about this particular relationship. Well, you know, I don't even think, I know you're like suggesting like, I don't think any movie like has that connection for me. I don't think like at any point a movie's like, like that becomes like a part of me or like, um, mm -hmm. you know, I enjoy a lot of movies. I, you know, recite a lot of movies. I will rewatch movies. Um, but I don't know, like if, if they have any like crossover impact on my life. Okay. Where, where I have like an attachment to it. No, I don't know. That's, that's congratulations. You are a healthy human being. <laughs> so I think you're, you're doing, wait, is this fine. a podcast about movies? Uh oh, <laughs> half and half. I totally understand that it's, if there was something in the enjoyment of this movie, any type of kernels that stayed with you, it, it could be just as, as simple as just like, I like their, they're connecting on a painting or, you know, well, actually I really did like that, that part of the movie. So that's funny because I have, and I'm sure we're going to get to this a little bit later. Like, mm -hmm. even though I, I love this, there's so, like I said, rewatchable and there's so many great scenes in this movie. I actually have like, at the core of it, like an issue with the movie about how they ended up, you know, quote unquote, falling in love, which is why I kind of hinted at like, maybe the perfect girl, you know, was actually better for him. So I am, I am intrigued and you, you'd hinted at this and now you've, you've, do, you've dove in deeper. So you had a little bit of a problem with it. Tell me a little bit more about it. The thing that like, I have a really hard time grasping having, you know, seen the movie so many times mm -hmm. is by the end of the film, and she hadn't seen him in months at this point. You know, she's pouring her heart out to him. And like, you know, she has our line. I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy. And don't get me wrong. Like, I'm into Hugh Grant. And I, like I said, I'm, I'm into him. But like, I don't think the movie did a great job of building that romance and that connection between those two. To get to that point where I thought as an actress, Julia Roberts was great. Right? I was totally, I felt the vibes right? In that scene, watching that scene, I'm like, oh my God, like she as an actress really feels like she's in love with this character. Right. And so, you know, I think I had like one experience with vibes in my life ever. Right. Where I don't like, I had a situation where I was, I was helping a classmate in college with work and like, I felt like something was off. You know, I just had this weird feeling and I felt like this person wanted to ask me something. And it's like, I was like, all of a sudden just nervous in the same way I was when I started this podcast with you, right? <laughs> I'm just like, why am I nervous? I'm helping them with their homework. Like, what is going on here? I'm feeling something. Mm -hmm. This is weird. So she leaves and like an hour later, I get a phone call where I'm working. It's like, uh, like, you know, I didn't want to say this before. I couldn't like find the words, but you know, I was wondering if, you know, and like ask me out. Right. And I'm like, I knew that was going to happen. Like, so I'm saying like, I felt that when Julia Roberts was doing that, I love that scene but I don't understand how her character is there. I, I agree with you. What's kind of strange is that they go from these, you know, different points and when they're actually spending time together. And I actually felt a bigger, uh, kind of connection to the movie when they're going through the parts when they weren't together. And what's even more interesting is that, you know, first they have their, you know, their first awkward encounter and then she kissed him in the very, very beginning. And I'm just like, Oh, wow. Is this like an ultimate fantasy movie? Cause like rom-com wise, I totally get it. You know, it's, it's like movie star falls in love with this guy, but then it's just like instantaneous. I'm just like, okay, ride the attraction. Let's do this. I, I, I can, I can run with this. This is no problem here. And then there's these instances where they're just like together and apart and together and apart. And when, when they're together, when there's a, there's the part where, the photographs of her from when she was doing uh, photos um, early in her career and they get released and it makes it look like yep. she had done. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it makes it look like that she had done. Um, it looks like a pornographic movie, even though she says it wasn't doesn't make a difference because the paparazzi are going to take their narrative and run with it. And when she's there and she goes to hide out in his place and just the days together, I was, I was feeling that, but it actually blew my mind when it turns out they were only together for less than a day. 
which makes sense. Paparazzi knows how to move fast when a starlet is hiding when in the midst of a scandal. Right. But for some reason, I don't, you know, it could be the way the movie was moving with it or how I felt that they were connecting with one another or that COVID has made it so sheltering in place means <sighs> I don't know when time is anymore. But I, I just like, wait, that was, that was a day? That was a big day though, because every minute I felt that part of the movie was them trying to make up for this lack of a love arc that I think I was missing. Yeah, that's fair. So, okay. So, but at the same time, though, like by that point, I'm just like, yes, be together, be together. But of course, it's kind of working itself up in true, you know, uh, fashion of just like, well, there has to be a conflict. Because if there wasn't a conflict, then how would we have a very happy grand romantic gesture at the end? Which I'm on board for all of these things, by the way. Right. <laughs> Which is enjoyable. Although I do, I do worry when your friends are are trying that hard to to do it with you and i'm just like oh somebody's gonna get hurt and i don't want that to happen (laughs) physically i mean somebody's gonna get you know run into traffic and then something bad is gonna happen but fortunately that did not work out in that way but beyond that i i agree with you uh where there are i mean there are beautiful individual moments them sneaking off into the garden Yep. And, 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 and sitting on the bench and just actually for a brief moment, I was confused because the scene where she's sitting on the bench and he just kind of slowly walks away from her. Did, did you know why he was walking? Was he giving her a moment? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Okay. But I know what you it mean is. about these moments. Like, I think there's a moment in the dinner scene where, you know, uh, Hugh Grant has brought her as a guest to his friend's house for dinner and where she kind of sits back and it's just taking it all in, you know, um, there are these really, really great moments. Yeah. There's, there is something to it about being comfortable in your romantic partner's company. Like if, you know, I, I, I appreciate the feeling of acceptance, but, uh, I don't know, that could just be me and generalized anxiety problems (laughs) (laughs) either way. But uh, no, I thought that was really nice. Uh, I actually dove into the trivia as well. And I guess I guess the original cut of this movie was three and a half hours long. Yeah, I heard that, too. I have I know I've looked up, you know, at various points in my life, Googled deleted scenes, Notting Hill. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't think I found anything like that interesting. I heard on the one of the DVDs, there's supposed to be more. But, you know, despite loving the movie, I don't think I've ever sought those out. Sure. I mean, at this point, sure. I don't own a DVD. Like, I don't even know where I, <laughs> I don't know where I could buy a DVD. Amazon, I imagine. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. In the uh, the used section, you can find yourself a uh, half price books in the DVD section right there, maybe. Well, if we're talking about like them falling in love, let me let me ask you the first meeting at the bookshop. OK. Does, did she clock him at all? Do you think in that moment she was like, oh, this dude's really attractive He's really kind of like cute in this British charming way. Mm. Like, did you, did you think in that moment, like this was, this was even going to be believable? In the very, very beginning, uh, all I could really absorb from her was, oh, her shields are on full power right now. Walking in, just want to find a book. Wow. You're still talking to me right now. Okay. I'm just, I just want to buy this book. And then fortunately, um, Gentleman stuffing a book down his pants provided a, a nice break right. for her to see him in his natural element yeah. of just like, yeah, can you, can you, can you please not steal from my store? Which then his powers were turned up full blast. And I think that was able to get her to just kind of take a minute. But I think she moved a half shield by the time she walked out because I'm willing to wager that being where she was and doing what she was and her complaining later on about the paparazzi in the area and the, the tabloids, which apparently, uh, it's, it's worse, you know, based off of what she said there. And, uh, from what I've heard about, like how they go after the Royal family and everything yep. like that, it's, it's very, very deep. So I, I, I think it provided a very interesting beginning of just like, well, I know where this story goes, so how is this going to progress? And is he going to you know, win her over with his natural charm? And clearly it wasn't working in the beginning. And as much as I like Hugh Grant, I just wanted to say, like, read the signs. Stop being adorable that way. Yeah, it's uh, interesting she goes in for the kiss. 
like that early into the movie. I remember my wife was like, wow, that was quick. That happened fast. That, yeah, I agree. It shocked me actually. I'm just like, oh, okay. Okay. Well done. Good for her. I think. Is he okay with this? It's funny because 1999, he probably could have went in for the kiss and it probably would have been okay. If that movie's released now and he makes that move, I think we're all like, whoa, dude. No, 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 Yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 100%. So, I mean, even just a little bit, her going in for that, I'm just like, is it, uh, okay, make sure he's okay with this. Okay, good. Yeah. But he, I think he was giving off. Well, I mean, it was 100% nervous energy from him. So I don't know still hard to tell really but i think he liked her it's okay side question for you though given the characters and their different versions of meeting who is arguably the most famous actress in the world which is what they're trying to tell us in this movie have you had a celebrity meeting where you got tongue-tied oh, that's a great question i don't think so i don't think what about you i I went to a podcast festival and there is this great, uh, he, he, okay. So he was the host of dinner and a movie. Uh, his name is Paul Gilmartin and he hosts this podcast called the mental illness happy hour. And I remember watching that show. Cause like I said, I watched a lot of movies on TBS who was hosting the interstitials, Paul Gilmartin while he was making a meal related to the movie. And so he, he did the show and I went to go meet him afterwards and I got so flummoxed because his, his, his podcast is about mental illness where he shares like these really deep stories and talks to his, uh, his guests. And so like, I'm like half starstruck and half like, thank you so much for your podcast. And I just, I couldn't get the words out. So when I took a picture of him, I look like I'm, um, actually like biting my tongue because I'm trying so hard to smile, but it's not working. So I could not get the words out of my mouth because it's just like, here's the guy I watched when I was younger and his like, he's like providing this amazing service for people at the same time. So that was my, I could not talk celebrity interaction. So. I mean, I've like, I've thought about it before, but like, it's never, I don't think I've ever met somebody who'd be, you know, considered a celebrity. Celebrity is relative. In yeah. All honesty. Yeah. No, no, yeah. for sure. So, um, with all of that and all of your history with this movie, when you watch this movie, when do you think they fell in love? Well, what's interesting is like, I would, I would ask the question this way. Did Hugh Grant ever really fall in love? Is there, is there ever a moment where like, now I get he's infatuated. I get mm -hmm. that, you know, if, you know, a movie celebrity walked into, you know, where I work Mm -hmm. be a little weird at school. I don't, um, but like in, I would, I would feel that sense of, Oh, this person, you know, she's beautiful. She's gorgeous. Um, you know, probably wealthy, but like, I don't ever find the moment in the movie where Hugh Grant, like has enough about her to like fall in love with her, right. To, to experience love with her. And so that's one of, that's one of the, the problems I have, with the film. In fact, like, I think there's three points in this movie where she does enough to like, Hey, you know, this is probably not the right person for you. I mean, there's, there's the scene, you know, obviously where she has a boyfriend, he finds out, mm -hmm. right. Didn't mention this has a boyfriend. Second time is, um, after the photos or after the paparazzi find out where she is and she's livid and she's upset. And I think at one point in that scene, he goes, this is crazy behavior, like what you're doing. Right. Now, I, I know like the idea is like, we don't know what it's like to live with paparazzi hounding us our whole life. Um, and, you know, so we're supposed to kind of like have a little empathy there for what her life must be like. Um, mm -hmm. And like, he should have absolutely stopped her from going to that door. Like, no question. Right. You're wearing, you just saw it was paparazzi. She's yeah. wearing your shirt. Dude, stop the, don't let her go out. You know, like yeah. I could be upset about that part, you know, <laughs> be upset about that part. Um, and then, you know, and then when she dismisses him, when he's listening um, at the end of the movie, when he's on the scene, uh, when he's on the set of that movie and she dismisses him to her colleague. And there's a fair enough reason for that. Um, right. But like, I think those three things overshadow like any moment he had with her, you know, mm -hmm. any endearing moment of climbing the fence or being able to hang out with his family and his friends um, and be cool. Like 
maybe, maybe that was in the 90 minutes that was cut. It has to be, there has to be some other just like kind of growing affection that, you know, is a little bit deeper than what we got to see in the two hours and five minutes that we had. So no, I, I agree with you. And, uh, one of the things that kind of just shows their incompatibility and I don't think there's enough there to show them like, let's rise above this. And also what's kind of sad is that even though it's meant to be like a very classic rom-com line, I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy. That's all he had to pair it back to his friends for them to go like, Oh dude, you blew it. And I'm like, no, I don't think that was enough. Unless it was meant to show that she had really broken down her, her walls to him, but I didn't necessarily see that as enough. So are we just going for the, the, the bigger romantic flourishes and are we all buying it? Yeah. I mean, I think because you, you do want to root for him, right? You, yes. you, you want that. Um, and maybe it's because, you know, we all want that celebrity to walk in. I mean, you've got Ryan and he's wonderful, I'm sure. Um, but maybe if Ryan Gosling, I don't know if that's your, your celebrity hunk, if he walks into <laughs> where you work. Um, but like, I think we're rooting for like that aspect of it. And, you know, you mentioned that scene at the end of the movie. So for as much as I'm like, well, I don't really buy like, you know, that Hugh Grant was in love. I still love the movie. And I love that scene in particular with the friends, the way that film is shot, the way that film is shot and written. I love how he changes his mind with his friends there. Spike comes in. He's like, you deaf prick. Um, and they're all like, no, no, it's actually quite sensible. And then they like slowly start the flip. Um, and they're like, that painting isn't the original, is it? Um, yeah, I think it might be. <laughs> and there's that panning shot um, after he repeats the line, you know, I'm just the, it, their jaws are on the floor. Like that scene for me is so great. And like mm -hmm. how it changes like the course, you know, and how they just, you know, they're all running and the piling into the car and it's exciting. Um, that part of the movie are the parts that I love. Mm -hmm. The way it's, no. the way it's written, the way it's filmed. Oh yeah, it's beautifully crafted and the way they put everything together. And, and what you had said earlier about, you know, his friends being part of it, there was, there was enough left in the interactions with them more than just the, the dinner with, uh, Anna spending time with them, but all the time that he was spending with them, uh, oh, wow. Just the, the dinner they had with their friend who had lost the restaurant and they were just kind of sitting around lamenting all of their lives. And, you know, it's it's probably good that they have this kind of like therapy session of all the things that are going yeah. wrong, but they're still there for each other. And so I think that's, that's, that's pretty good for him. And also, you know, he talks about his, like his first failed marriage and all the people that he had. And it was actually a, you know, a good thing in part of the writing that like one of the loves of his life was sitting right there, married to his best friend. I'm just like, yeah again, was this part of the three and a half hours? Like it, I, I was really interested in their story. Yeah. You know, just a little bit, cause they're, they're really cute with his inability to cook and, and just their story just seems really sweet. Yeah. It's classic British self-deprecating humor. <laughs> I guess I have to prepare myself the next time. Cause I'm just like, wow, they're really mean. And then an hour and a half in, I'm just like, Oh, they're just ribbing each other. I got it. I'm good. I'm in again. Okay, cool. Uh, you had, you had alluded to the blind date city it had and the perfect girl. Yeah. Now that was even a shorter instance of screen time together. So what is it about that, that you felt, felt a little bit better? I just felt that was a situation, you know, obviously we only got 15 seconds of them sitting at a table. Right. So like, is that deeper than what he would have had with Julia Roberts? I mean, from a screen standpoint, no. But it, I, I like the idea of him exploring that other relationship and seeing what something else would be like. Um, and, you know, he even described that situation as perfect. Like when he was finished with a date, he sat down on the couch and said, perfect. Um, you know, and like, I would have loved to find out, like, did they have a second date? Right? We kind of skip through time a lot. A lot of this movie happens, like you said, it happens with them apart. You know, I wonder how much actual screen time the two of them have together. It'd be fun to clock that next time I watch it. Just out of curiosity. That's um, a good call. So it's just, it's just the, I think that it just seems more likely that he would end up with somebody like the perfect girl than to end up in the relationship with Julia Roberts, who from, you know, all accounts, you know, 
didn't really seem to be in love with him and him with her. And, you know, there, there were a couple of times where Julia Roberts is really great. Like I said, when she's delivering that line, I'm just a girl standing. And I think there's a moment when there, she wants to invite him up to the hotel mm-hmm. and she's nervous about it. Now, some that might be, I have a boyfriend. I hope he doesn't find out, but I don't think so. It was like, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really liking this person, you know, and I want to invite them up and I want to take this next step and whatever this could be. Um, and like, that was a really good, like, again, it comes down, I think it's Julia Roberts acting more than anything, but. Yeah, there is something about that, especially you said you were about 19 when this movie came out. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, what's great is that even though she's supposed to be close to 30, you know, she's in her late twenties based off of math I did in that movie, like just that nervousness. I'm just like, oh, wow. It's, it's like, it's still universal when a relationship is fresh. If you're young, you know, in your teens, or if you're, you know, nearing your twenties and you can, you know, have the world, you know, in the palm of your hand or, yeah, I mean, at least I assume so when you're a famous actress, but, uh, yeah, just excellent acting on her part, conveying that. And I I think it clearly was effective. Now, if the movie movie shows us as far so it was the first time that i saw this movie and i had seen the bench scene before i don't know how i saw it it just happened so i'm just like all right so a lot of this movie i know the beats so he goes back to her grand romantic gesture uh works his way into the press conference and he's able to basically declare himself in front of the press uh and then we have a happy ending of a, a wedding, and I'm assuming they bought property in that garden they, where that bench was, or are they still trespassing? Uh, at the end of the movie? Mm-hmm. It's a different bench, so I don't think it's the same bench. Uh, oh, because, good. Because the original one had an engraving on it. It was, you know, in in memory of somebody. And yeah. um, the bench in the park was was different. I think that was just in a public park. I think people running around. Okay, good eye. I just assumed they bought property in that <laughs> that particular area, and I'm just like, oh, good I, for them. I mean, I think that's safe to assume. I think, you know, that's what they're setting up. Yours makes more sense. Nah, I appreciate that observation. Okay, so here we are, and and also there is um, a baby bump involved, yep. and there's, there's also um, a scene where he's going to, a, I assume, a movie premiere with her, so he's in the life with her, yep. but they also have kind of like a quiet existence and a happy, happy wedding day. Um, I guess the goat is on or something in that painting is included in their wedding cake, which is a cute little detail that yep. I missed, but thank you. I am DB trivia. Um, after that, um, do you have any predictions on what happens next? Yeah. You know, I think the, I think the author, the, the writer and the director did a good job of like setting up where they want us to believe it goes. Okay. Right. And in, in that, you know, that short sequence, it was not more than a minute, minute and 30 seconds at most where it showed what their life would be like afterwards, the wedding and on the bench and the baby bump and the things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, so my, my guess is that's what the author intends. I don't think, I guess what, well, I guess I should say the, the writer and the director and not the author. I guess that's what the writer and the director intend for us to think that's happens. Do I think, again, it goes back to like, do I think that relationship's going to work? I'm still like, ah, I still, I don't know. I mean, I hope so because, you know, I want to root for Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts in that. Um, I mean, I don't think it is. Like if I, if I got to, if there was a follow-up movie in the way they do the before sunrise and the before sunset films, like right. I think they're, I think they're broken up in having an argument in a car. That feels very real. <laughs> In all honesty. And, and funny you bring that up because when I was having that, you know, feeling of time in that one scene, it actually felt very similar to, I'm just like, wow, this feels like very before sunrise right now, except I knew that was 24 hours. So that's, that's a a pretty apt description. There is that, that montage that you mentioned is very, very real in their intent to try to set us off on like, here's the happy. But I, I saw so much fear in his eyes when he went to that premiere and I'm just like, oh, he's he just has to get his like movie premiere legs going, and it should be fine. But what what I don't think is all that fair is that in the beginning, when he was pushed into the junket, and yeah. he had to like 
work through giving, giving her an interview. She gave him like no help whatsoever. And I don't know if that's like a good glimpse into how she's really not going to help him adjust into this life. That's a, that's a really great, I love that insight. That is a great, like, yeah, no, you're totally right. She definitely <laughs> lets, she lets him see if he's got the chops for that without, without offering any help. Yeah. And you know, he did really, really good rolling with the punches by, you know, interviewing the rest of the cast. Oh, it's great. Um, I mean, I, I, I would love to have actually, you know, cause my wife's like, no, I think I've seen it. I would have loved to have sat through that scene with somebody who had never seen it. And just, I wouldn't have watched the TV. I would have just turned sideways and watched them like just to see them experience that. Cause I'd love, like, it's unexpected. It's unexpected. I didn't, you know, the first time watching, I'm like, oh, okay. Oh wait, this is hilarious. He's going to have to. <laughs> and then the little girl like, oh, this is great. <laughs> Yeah. And he gets better at it. He gets, you're right. He gets better at it as he goes. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, shout out to Misha Barton, who apparently plays the young actress in that, in that particular scene. Ooh, that was going to be, oh, that was going to be in my, uh, true false game. You're, uh, you're on top of it. You've done your homework. Oh, thank you much. Cool. Um, right. No, I, I agree as well. So they're fighting. Are they fighting and divorcing? That's interesting. I mean, she seems like the person who kind of takes those extremes. I mean, like she went away for whatever months and then just came back and like, I have this million dollar painting and I love you. It's like, whoa, what? Yeah. Why don't we just meet up for coffee or something and talk? <laughs> <laughs> so I could see her just be like, my agent filed the paperwork. We were getting divorced. Uh, just sign this. I could see that totally happening. I, I can. And, and given when he first rejects her, when, when she lays it all out for her, he was really onto something when he said like, if this happens again, he's going to like fall into it. And if it happens again, I see your face everywhere. And he cannot accept that if it doesn't work out, he will have his heart broken over and over and over again. And that's, you know, you know, good for him for trying to protect that. Um, I, but I think he was right. And I think, I think he's going to get his heart broken over and over again. Um, he, I was thinking possibly that maybe he'd get like become a producer on some of these things, but I don't think that's really the way he wants to live his life and not to get too into it, but like a small bookstore, which we don't really have that many anymore. That's very specific to travel, which is something we can't really do anymore. I I'm not really sure how, how much, you know, he can sustain himself when you have like, yes, there are relationships where there's like the completely, you know, person being the breadwinner, but like, you know, this is like huge fame versus, you know, the quote unquote civilian. So, I mean, at, at least in the, in the ones that I've seen, it's like the investment banker or like, you know, something that's, you know, the real estate developer where it should kind of make sense, but they're, you know, successful in their own ways. So I, I'm sad to say that I, I see her cutting it off after a while when one of her moods hits, like she'll have, oh, and I also want to be kind of sad because it's like the Katie Holmes, Tom Cruise thing with Surrey, where it's just like, he'll have the daughter and then the mega star will keep being the mega star elsewhere and then visit every once in a while. I just assume that's how it is. That's what the tabloids told me. And I believe the tabloids. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe that's that, maybe there's that world where, you know, the, the, the writer wants us to believe that Julia Roberts character really was like put off by the industry. Right. She talked about the dinner, you know, she's 19. She hasn't had a, she's been on a diet since she was 19. Um, and the paparazzi are hounding her and all that. If, if she truly did want to get away from that, if she truly did want to, you know, she had an abusive boyfriend, she pointed that out. If she really did want to step away from that, then, then Hugh Grant's the right person. Sure. Yeah. There's, there's that tiny glimmer of shining light. Oh, see now, I'm, now I'm rooting for them again and I'm hopeful. <laughs> See, that's better. I, I, I didn't want to come in here and say, uh, Notting Hill's not real. Uh, it never should have worked out and they get divorced in the end. So let's, let's leave, let's, let's go with that note. Let's go with that. Okay. Note. I can, I can see that. Do you, okay, fine. We'll, we'll go this way then. This renewed interest in art will have her pivot to a other type of method of financial security. And that way she doesn't have to worry about her aging star, you know, fading in the future. So that way she can still be 
part of that world, but at the same time, a little bit behind the scenes so she can have her happiness elsewhere with her growing family and Hugh Grant. I'd be happy with Hugh Grant. (laughs) Well, we'll call it a happy ending then. Now that works pretty well. You, you said something about some, some games and true falseness. I stepped on one of them, but I want to play. Right. So, um, you had mentioned before that I had a, I had a podcast and there's like two different voices on it. I'm just like, my job is to like, kind of like entertain a little bit. And my co-host is like the technical, really good player of the game we play. And like, he explains high level strategy. Um, so it's like my job to try to like come up with like fun things to do and his job to like teach people how to play better. Um, so it's a, it's a good dynamic. So I like to like create true false games or fill in the blanks. Um, so that's what I created for you. I have a, I have a Notting Hill lightning round, true false, fill in the blank. Um, I've got 10 questions. I'm going to have to make up an 11th bonus um, because you stole the Misha Barton one already. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Now, I think, I think having seen the movie just once and recently um, is going to be fair enough, I guess. I don't think there's anything that's going to... It sounds like you do your homework. Okay. So here we go. Notting Hill, lightning round, true false. Mm-hmm. Notting Hill is the best rom-com Oh, no. Uh, f- false. No, it's true. Wow. Dang it. What? I'm, I'm creating this. Like, wait. I know. I'm uh, like, well, are we talking? Uh, okay. I should have. I didn't want to. Okay, go. Okay. Sorry. Lightning. True, false. IMDb actually classifies Notting Hill as a horror movie. False. No, uh, that's correct. You're right. It is false. IMD does not class, but it should be because, like, I was terrified at the end of that that Hugh Grant wasn't going to get the girl. So... Like it could be, it could be a horror movie. And so I think of it sometimes as a horror movie, but you're right. You want to classify that as a thriller? Yeah, that works too. That that would work too. But I was, I was terrified. Like, so you got, you got that one correct. Okay. I got one. Notting Hill. ah, We talked about this one. I forgot. Notting Hill was meant to be a sequel to Pretty Woman. False. Yeah. No, it wasn't. I had this like whole thing set up about how there's that scene in uh, the middle of the movie where they're having dinner and like those lads are like talking very, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Crudely? Uh, crass. 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 Yeah. crass about her. Um, and they mentioned prostitutes. So I'm like, oh no, it's actually a link because her character was a prostitute. Like, okay. You got that one correct as well. Two points. Oh, thank, thank you. The magazine Hugh Grant pretends to write for is Horse and Hound. Yeah, that's true. True, false. I have been to Notting Hill and knocked on the house with the blue door. False. Wow. No, that's right. Yeah, you're right. Darn. Oh, it's, ooh, it, ooh. is could, it not there anymore? Oh, Can that would have been it? like like a trick. Um, yeah. I, you know, I've read like at one point they painted it black, and then there's new owners, and they painted yeah. it back to blue. But it wasn't it wasn't meant to be a trick, other than. Oh. Why would I, it was actually meant like, why would he say that if he hasn't done that? That's a weird one. So it has to be true, but it was actually false. So okay. you're very good at this game. Oh, thanks. Except for that first one. All right. Fill in the blank. Tempting, but now these are lines from the movie. So this is going to be a little trickier. Tempting, but it's at the beginning of the film. Tempting, but no. Yeah. Oh, you're good. You got it. All right. Surreal, but. Surreal, but pleasant? It's surreal, but nice. Nice. Surreal, but nice. nice It gets repeated. It's funny you got no, because I don't think that gets repeated, but surreal, but nice gets repeated a couple times. Right. Okay. You're going to get this one. Happiness isn't happiness without a violin playing. Killed. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, we would have liked to, but it was difficult, obviously, being set in. This is when he comes to her. Space. Yeah, it's space. Yes. You got it. It's seven. And absolutely certain never to hear from Anna once she's heard his nickname at school was? Floppy. Yeah. That was eight points. I had a bonus one set up for you, but you stole it. So true, false. 
Notting Hill is based on a true story. False. It's true, actually. Mm. Yeah, so Richard Curtis actually has a, or had a friend who met somebody super famous. Now, my source is Hugh Grant on that. So if you want to challenge me, you're challenging Hugh Grant. Yeah, and, no challenge. Yeah, as I pointed out, you shouldn't do that. Eight, that's really good. You did a great job. Great job with, uh, with the game. I, also, I was also thinking about what you would do now. Let's say we wanted to recast the movie. It's mm -hmm. 2020, mm -hmm. and you can't use any of the original actors. Who would you cast as like the main, as the lead? We can just go with the leads, Julia Roberts and, and Hugh Grant. Who would you pick now to star in that movie? It's a shot for shot remake. <laughs> shot for shot remake. Uh, you know, this is actually pretty similar to what I was just lamenting earlier, you know, because Julia Roberts is like Julia Roberts, basically. And I'm just like, do we have a Julia Roberts now? Who is like the ultimate and... So the closest I can really come up with is, and this is part of my recast, Jennifer Lawrence. Okay. So she would be my there. That's what's really hard though, is that so you know, who would be the the gentle, unassuming uh I mean, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pull it out of my cap and say Benedict Cumberbatch. Okay. Okay. Those work. I could he see that. Have floppy hair. He could totally have the, the the floppy hair. And I definitely considered Jennifer Lawrence when I was thinking about it for myself. Sure. Definitely considered her. I was thinking for Julia Roberts' character, like I wanted like that classic Audrey Hepburn type actress. And so I went with Anne Hathaway. That's a good one. And That's really good. For my Hugh Grant, I went I went a little bit different. It would be it wouldn't be it wouldn't necessarily be the 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 British humor, but I went uh Joseph Gordon Levitt. Yeah. It'd be a slightly, it's not, he wouldn't be doing Hugh Grant. He would be doing himself, but himself in that role. So you, you, you've tapped onto my, one of my childhood crushes. So I. Anne Hathaway? I, yeah. I, isn't she it's, great? Yeah. 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 No. Uh, yeah. Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Um, so funny. Ever since Angel's in the outfield and I'm, I'm just like, he's like, like maybe two years older <laughs> than me. So I'm like. I'm like, hi, ah, you're like 10 and I'm like eight. And like, <laughs> I like him a lot. And then, you know, he was in 10 things I hate about you and the rock from the sun. And like, he's doing all this stuff now. So like, when you said that, I'm just like, yeah, he's dreamy. And he can definitely play like the, uh, I mean, have you seen 10 things I hate about you? <laughs> have I seen 10 things I hate about you? <laughs> what? I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a rom-com podcast talking about Notting Hill. So I don't have to explain his character to you no. about how he's just trying to get the, okay. All right. So, so begging your pardon, I think he could, he could play that role very well. Okay. <laughs> I was worried he was too good looking. That was my concern. I mean. Cause the thing I like about Hugh Grant is like that just British charm and like the way the cadence, when Hugh Grant delivers a line, he could say anything like the thing with apricots and honey, like just the way he says it, his cadence of speaking like, mm -hmm. I don't know if you write that. I don't know. I don't know if Richard Curtis wrote that. I feel like that's just what he brings to it, but I don't know. <laughs> it's probably a, a, a synergy, a Wonder Twins power activating of his writing and his, and his delivery. Oh, that was really fun. Can I ask you a bonus casting question then? Yeah. Who would be your spike? I had, so I thought about it. I had a Jason, oh. I had Jason Manzoukas. I can't believe you just said Jason Manzoukas. <laughs> now, there's... I was, go ahead. I'll, I'll no, let no, you go. No, just, no, you go first, because now I'm worried. I'll, go ahead. Oh, no. well, okay. So I don't know if we were saying this on the... Probably before we started recording, but you 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 mentioned a casting, and I'm I'm going to be on another podcast where we will be casting um, a new Hercules movie that we're making up, and I'm just like, uh, can I make my Hercules Jason Manzoukas? Okay. Because you know, 100% Greek. And also like, according to him, he's gotten totally shredded after being in quarantine for this long. So I'm like, I think he can do it. So the fact that you just threw him out here right now, his range is, is incredible. <laughs> so I bow to your, your sidekick. I mean, he's, he's fantastic. Oh, so now <laughs> what's going to make this funnier is the reason that I picked him, which is why I wanted you to go first, but I'm still going to say it anyway. Um, mm -hmm. 
So my wife hated Spike, hated Spike. I think in movies when they have that character, like mm -hmm. he's written that way. Like that's not like, he's not that way in real life. Um, and so, but she really hates that character or like if we're watching television shows and there's like that character you're not supposed to like, she like genuinely hates that person. And um, so when I was asking her, I'm like, oh, I got to cast this movie. Who would you put? And she's like, well, I hate Jason Manzukas. Because she hates his character in movies, not him as a person. I'm sure, I'm sure he's a great guy. I'm, you know, it's, but she hates she, the characters he plays. She's not wrong in yeah. that certain characters. I mean, see, now I have to make it my life's mission to find the right role for him that he's already played for her. So I'm imagining him in like the league and like all of these other creepy characters. He plays, he plays a creep. He, he self admits it, but you know, the man has to work. So I get it. So, oh, wow. We will talk about this more off air, but I, let's see if we can find the right role for her to watch with Jason Manzoukas in it for her to love him the way he deserves to be. Loved. That's a, that's a good idea. <laughs> oh my God. We'll be okay. So you be Hugh Grant. I'll be Richard Curtis. We'll throw it together. We'll have the perfect thing in the Manzoukas realm for your wife. Done and done. Excellent. <laughs> Did I play all the games already? That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that, those, are, those are just the two. That's fantastic. Oh, and you put this in all episodes of The Misplay? Um, yeah, in, in every episode, I try to include something. Um, I think with Ryan, we might have played a game called Name That Card. Um, I just, for me, like podcasting has to be about entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, like, I don't listen necessarily to my podcast for strategy. You know, it's not, you know, I, I'm just more interested in being entertained when I listen to podcasts. Well, uh, I greatly appreciate you coming onto mine and entertaining definitely me and my listeners when this drops. Well, I really appreciate it. And of course I need to thank Ryan as well. Cause it was Ryan that made this connection for me. We, we met at a, a random meetup and I think like 10 seconds into meeting him, he's like, Oh, my wife has a podcast too. And I'm like, what's it about? I'm like, put me on it. I want to talk about Notting Hill. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like a weird way to meet somebody like, within a minute in the conversation, like I want to be on your wife's podcast and I want to talk about Notting Hill. And here we are uh, a little over a year later. We're doing that. We made it happen. So thank you, Ryan. Uh, I know you'll be listening to this. Um, not right now. He's not in the room, but he will be listening to this. Uh, so no, this was fantastic. Uh, once again, the, the name of your podcast is The Misplay and it's on themisplay.com. Um, anywhere people can find you on social media? Uh, you know, I... I, you can find our misplay on, on Twitter as well, but I think uh, what would be more interesting if anybody cared was my actual Twitter. So that's at Parmalee. So that's just my last name, at Parmalee, P-A-R-M-E-L-E. -E. And um, I believe I have the funniest Twitter on Twitter, but I, I think the fact that I don't have a 10 million followers sort of disproves that, but I think I'm hilarious. Well, that could just be proof that you're unappreciated in your own time. That's what I think. I actually have a tweet. I have a tweet that's like, when somebody finds my Twitter, eventually it's going to be like finding Game of Thrones for the first time. It's like, wow, this is amazing. I cannot believe I didn't know this. And I have seven seasons to watch. And I don't include the eighth season. Like, it's like eighth I was going to say, was we're terrible. talking like the first couple of seasons, yeah. right? Not yeah. Okay. No, we're not. We're not talking about the last few. It's like the first four episodes of The West Wing. So uh, that's a huge endorsement for following... Uh, let's see, that's uh, at P-A-R-M-E-L-E. -E. Yep, at Parmalee. And while you're at it, you can follow Happily Ever Aftermath on Twitter and Instagram at Heemcast, H-E-A-M-C-A-S-T. And we're also on Facebook at Happily Ever Aftermath. I can't thank you enough, Jason. This was fantastic. You're welcome. Thanks so much. All right. So uh, until next time, may your aftermath be happy. Bye.